In the last video, we have created, compiled, and deployed our first smart contract. Now, while this was exciting, the smart contract itself couldn't do too much. The only thing you could do was requesting a value from the blockchain, a static value that is. Now, in this video, I will tell you about functions and modifiers for the functions and variables, and this essentially is where things get interactive. All right, let's get started. Now, the first thing you have to know when we talk about functions is that functions are the executable parts of smart contracts. Now recall, even though last time we haven't explicitly declared any functions, we didn't write them, I told you that by setting one of the variables as public, Solidity did in the background actually create a function for us and it was a getter function. So the reason why we have been able to interact with the smart contract and to request a value in our last example was because we've declared one of these variables as public and because Solidity has in the background without us now noticing uh, created one of these functions, okay? Now in this video, what we're doing is we're looking at how we can explicitly create these functions. So create a function, a custom one, where you're saying whenever this gets invoked, whenever somebody plays around with this function, uh, usually by sending a transaction uh, to the blockchain, to this specific contract address, and by declaring that he or she wants to invoke this specific function, then whatever we specify in the function body actually happens. Okay, that's the general idea. And that's the way these smart contracts actually get interactive. Without functions, it would, would just be some, some static code on there uh, and no one could interact with the smart contract. So all of the interaction we're seeing is through these functions. Now, the first thing we look at is the function structure. So we have the function right here. That's the keyword that declares that there will be a function. Then, of course, you have a function name. You have some parameters. Somebody who is interacting, uh, invoking this function can send along. So, for example, when the function would store something on the blockchain, then obviously you have to send that data uh, along uh, the transaction whenever you're invoking this function. And uh, this would be part of the parameters, for example. Then we will talk about modifiers uh, that can modify how the function can be accessed, for example. Um, we are talking about return values later on. And then, uh, of course, then you have the function uh, body right here. So um, within these curly brackets there, that's where the instructions for the functions actually will be. So for the function name, you can pick whatever you want. Uh, it makes sense that it's that it's something that uh, has something to do with whatever the function does. So for example, when you store something, you could call it store um, when you're requesting a certain value and then would be something like read and so on. So it just makes sense that you, just by looking at the function name, you know approximately what the function is supposed to do for readability. But uh, essentially you can pick just any name for your function. Now, that being said, it must be unique. Um, it cannot be uh, that there are two functions that have the same name, and I think that should be rather obvious. And then the second thing we talked about are the parameters. Um, these are essentially variables uh, that are sent alongside the transactions that invoke the function and are later on used in the function body. Uh, so for example, um, when you have a store function and the store function expects the uh, person who invokes this function to uh, send a parameter along uh, to store a value on the blockchain, let's say an uh, unsigned integer, uh, then this has a name, this parameter, and uh, you, you basically use this name once again in the function body to store it in one of the state variables. And recall that the state variables are just the uh, variables of the contract, so the ones we also we have defined last time, um, basically the persistent storage of the smart contract, okay? Now, to differentiate the two from, from one another, uh, it's good practice to start parameters, so function arguments, with an underscore, um, because they cannot have the same name as any of these state variables that are part of the smart contract. So whenever you have a, a parameter, you usually start it by underscore, and uh, that's actually mm, best practice. That's a good recommendation, something you should use when you are creating these function parameters. Then you have modifiers. As I said, modifiers, they are for accessibility, uh, state permissions, you will see later on that there are certain modifiers that can change the way uh, you're interacting with the function. And then you have special modifiers and you can even create your own modifiers and then um, you add them right here. 
um, right behind the parameters. So right here with the modifiers, that's where you add essentially these permissions uh, and anything that changes the way you interact with it. And then return variables, uh, it's entirely optional. But whenever you declare that the function returns something, and then you have to return variables here within the brackets, and that's essentially what you're getting back when you're interacting with the function. Okay, so that's the basic structure. Now, I, I think it will become much clearer when we look at actual examples, but it's still good to have this theoretic concept of the structure and to know what can be part of these functions. Now, the next thing we're going to look at are accessibility modifiers. Accessibility modifiers define which accounts can access a function or a variable. So essentially they define uh, who can interact with the function and therefore with the smart contract. They are explicitly required for all functions and they can be defined for variables, but they don't have to be defined for variables. If they are not defined, then you have a default value for the variables, which is set to private. Now here you have a, a table where you can see what it actually does. So the different keywords and uh, on, on the left side right here, so private, internal, external, and public. And here you have the different kinds of accounts. So uh, EOA, as we know from the previous videos, that's the externally owned account, which in this case issues the transaction and interacts with the smart contract. This contract refers to the contract that contains the function or the variable inheriting contracts that will become much clearer later on when we actually talk about inheritance. That's the idea that you have a different contract that inherits from this contract. And then the question, can this inheriting contract interact with this contract right here? And then external contracts just refers to any other third party contract. So whenever you have another contract account, can this external contract interact with the function or the variables we are defining in our contract, okay? And then you have uh, no, obviously, when this is not possible, yes, when it is possible. So when it's public, so let's go with the function first. When you have a public function, uh, then anyone, so it can be an EOA and through a transaction, it can be this contract and that, yeah, that you recycles essentially the function, another function, it can be an inheriting contract, it can be an external contract. All of these accounts can call this specific function. Similarly for a variable, when you have a public variable, then anyone can just read this variable, okay? They can just essentially make use of the, the getter function and uh, access the variable. External is different. With external, it can be used through an EOA, but it cannot be used through this contract or any inheriting contracts, but it can also be used uh, through an external account, okay? So it means pretty much, essentially means anyone except this contract and inheriting contracts. Internal again is different. Internal means the EOA cannot, EOAs cannot use it. All the smart contracts cannot use it. Internal means it's just all the functions that are part of this smart contract or inheriting contracts we can act, which can access this function um, essentially. And then you have private means uh, EOAs cannot use it. Inheriting cannot use it, external contracts cannot use it. It's just this one contract that can use it. Now, what's important to know is that external can only be used for functions. So it's not possible for variables uh, that it can be only accessed by an EOA uh, and uh, external contracts, um, but not by this account or inheriting accounts. That's always something that has to happen for variables. And the other thing is that whenever you, and I already mentioned that, and we have seen an example of that last time, whenever you declare a variable as public, then Solidity will in the background create a getter function with the same name for you. So essentially when a variable is public, there will be a function created, a function that allows you to uh, uh, read uh, the value of that variable, okay? And what's super important also to understand, because there are usually many misconceptions with that regard, you have to be aware that you cannot hide any information on the blockchain. I mean, there are always, um, whenever you basically rely on a combination of on and off chain data, you have some ways where, for example, you can uh, use hash values on the blockchain and store data off chain. You have things like commit and reveal schemes you will also look into later on. But whenever the data is stored on the blockchain, it doesn't really matter uh, whether there is an explicit uh, getter function or 
It also doesn't matter what you define right here. Um, this just means whether it can be accessed in the context of a transaction. But you cannot hide something from people, okay? It's, it's a public database. And uh, recall that last time we looked at the way uh, these, these values are stored on the blockchain. And so even though you cannot use it, you cannot access it in the context of a transaction, there is always a way for people to get the information. Um, so again, I'm just going to mention that one more time because it's a misconception um, many people have. Private does not mean that it cannot be accessed, uh, the information cannot be accessed uh, by people. It just means it cannot be accessed in a specific context, but it is still readable. You still can get the information out and you cannot hide anything on the blockchain. That's something you have to be aware of, okay? Now, let us look at the state permission modifiers really quick. And state permission modifiers define which functions can read from or modify, that means write to uh, the state. So basically change things on the blockchain, okay? And there are two of these keywords, two of these modifiers, and that's pure and view. Um, we have, have we already? No, I don't, I don't think we have used it explicitly. Implicitly we did again through the getter function uh, because the getter function that has been created essentially is one of these uh, view functions. So when you have a function with the keyword view, what does it do? It says, hey, yes, you can read from the blockchain, but you cannot write on it. You cannot change the state. The only thing you can do is you can get a value as last time with our answer variable where we got a value. And what's special about this is whenever you're just getting a value from the blockchain, so whenever you have the view keyword as part of a function, uh, you do not have to issue a transaction to interact with the smart contract. Since you're not changing anything, there is no reason to send a transaction to the blockchain. What you're doing is you're just getting the value from the blockchain and that's, that's, this can be done without a transaction, okay? So whenever you have a view keyword in the function, this means two things. First of all, you can only read from the blockchain. You cannot write or change anything. And second, there is no transaction needed to do that. You can just do that essentially locally when you have a full node, uh, get the information and that's it, okay? Then the second one is pure. Um, and that means you neither write, so in this, in this regard it's the same, nor read from the blockchain. So there is no blockchain interaction whatsoever. It's just one of these pure functions where you're doing something, but you're, you're not reliant on any uh, on knowing the state of the blockchain, nor do you change anything. I can give you a quick example. In, in many cases, we will work with hash values and you are essentially com computing a hash value uh, from, from some data, okay? So, so we have some, uh, let's see, a secret, um, and then you're, you're, you're hashing it and um, this function of hashing it uh, could be a pure function. So what you're doing is you just have this function, you're interacting with it, the only data it needs is external data provided as a parameter, uh, as an argument, as a function argument. Then it does something and gives you something back, but it neither reads from the blockchain, so it has no state dependency, nor does it write anything on the blockchain. In that case, it's a pure function. And of course, for these pure functions, you also do not require a transaction. It's just essentially um, an interaction with the smart contract that can be done again locally, um, assuming you have a full node or otherwise through one of these service providers that uh, run a full node on behalf of you. There are additional special modifiers for functions. Uh, the first one that's super important is payable. Uh, whenever you have a payable modifier, this means that the function can receive ETH, ether as part of the transaction. Okay, so you have to specifically declare that when you set a function as payable, it means, yes, this function will accept ether. It's not only about the data, it's not only about invoking uh, the function, it also can receive ether, okay? And you do that, uh, we are using, we have to use a modifier because a worst case, it could be that you have a smart contract that doesn't know how to handle ether, cannot do anything with it. In this case, when you have to specifically declare it as payable, uh, then there is a lower risk of somebody receiving EFO by accident and not getting it out anymore, okay? So that's why we have the specific modifier. Then you have a virtual and override. Uh, we will talk, talk a lot more about these two uh, special modifiers later on. What they do essentially is 
uh, they specify how functions get overridden uh, when you have inheritance. So when you have a base contract, let's say, and an inheriting contract, and uh, you, you have the two functions with the same name, um, then you can specify, you can explicitly declare uh, how these functions are overwritten uh, from the inheriting contract. So how the inheriting contract, for example, overrides the functions from the base contract, okay, in this case. Then you have special modifiers for variables. For example, constant and, in, uh, constant and immutable. Uh, constant and immutable disallow any changes to these variables um, during the contract's lifetime. So you're saying, hey, this variable cannot be changed later on. And of course, it also couldn't be changed when you just have no function to do so. But it's always good practice, just also for security reasons, to uh, if something shouldn't be changed at all, to just declare it as a constant or immutable. The difference is that immutable, in contrast to constant, can be set during contract deployment. So as part of the constructor, uh, you can set this value, and uh, with with uh, with uh, constant, it can it can not even be changed. Then, okay, that's the difference. And then we have custom modifiers. Um, these are user-defined modifiers. Again, we will talk about this later on, but this is usually done um, as a simple role concept. So when you're saying here you have modifiers as some form of access permission, for example, you could use these modifiers or there are various other uh, possibilities how you could create them. But essentially it allows you to just uh, create some keyword, um, add some rules to the keyword and then um, reuse uh, these rules just uh, for, for various uh, um, functions uh, just by using the keyword that you have somewhere specified, okay? All right, so let's look at the first exercise. And the first thing you do is ma you make the variables beneficiary, highest bid, highest bidder, and has ended public. And you do that essentially to uh, implicitly create these getter functions for these variables. So something very similar to what we have done last time with the answer uh, variable, um, where uh, that allowed us to interact with the smart contract uh, when Solidity implicitly created this getter function. That's something you also do here for your auction contract. And then the second thing you do is you create a, an additional function, this time an explicit function, so one you code yourself, that allows any EOA or external contract to set the beneficiary. And that allows you from an EOA or from another contract to change the variable beneficiary, to, to set a new address as the beneficiary, essentially. And the first thing is you simply get the uh, variable values. And uh, that's also something we have already done last time. Uh, of course, you do that um, by uh, using Remix. And uh, let us actually look at how we can do that right now. All right, so the first thing we do is setting these variables as public. So here we have the beneficiary, the highest bid also public, highest bidder public, has ended also public. And then with that, let us go to the compile tab, compile the contract, the deployment tab. And here it's important that you switch to injected web free once again. We quickly check that we are on Robston, that's the case. You can also see that right here, that's your address, and then you click on deploy. And uh, of course, it's a transaction, a deployment transaction for the smart contract. And as always, we can check that on the Block Explorer, in this case on Etherscan, to see whether the transaction went through. Now, this will take a while, uh, so we're using a 2x operator for the video. But then after a while, as always, it will get confirmed. And that's the case right now. We have a success right here. So let us switch back. And uh, you see the deploy contract right here. You have these functions. So when you click on beneficiary, you get the default value. Same has ended, same on highest bit, and same on highest bidder. So, so far, we only have the default value. So we have these getter functions because of the public uh, keywords, because of the public modifier. Now, let us add the uh, function so that we can initialize um, our beneficiary. So a function, we call it initialize, 
uh, we have a parameter, an address parameter, which is the beneficiary with an underscore before it because it's the function parameter. And we set this function as external. So you have the curly brackets and then the function body. What we do is we say beneficiary, in this case, the state variable equals underscore beneficiary. So the parameter, the function parameter. And you can see right here that this underscore beneficiary, you find it also right here and the state variable beneficiary, you can also find it up here. So uh, there's a difference between the two. We compile it once again. Then we go to the deployment tab we delete the old contract, obviously not from the blockchain, we just make sure it's not in the interface anymore, and then we deploy it, have a deployment transaction, confirm it, and once again, we can check on the block explorer, so on etherscan, um, pick it right here, jump. And now we have a success, so it has been confirmed. We go back once again, and here you have the new contract, so it's a new address, and you can also see that the initialize function is up there. When we check uh, the getter functions, uh, we still have the default values, but here you can actually add an address to the initialize. We copy it, account one, by clicking on it, paste it right here, and then invoke the initialize function. It's an orange function, it's something we want to uh, write on the blockchain. So it is a transaction, it's an actual transaction, one that we can also check again here on Etherscan. And as always, it will take a while. And then after a while, at some point, it will get confirmed. And that's the case right now, we have a success. Now when you scroll down, you can see right here, uh, the function we have called initialize, uh, the method IGD corresponds to the function, and here you have the address, um, it, which is basically the value which we have set. And when you click on beneficiary again, you can see the address right here, so it's not the default value anymore. In this case, it's the address we have set. All right, and for your reference, you also have the solutions on the slides right here. Uh, this makes it easier to copy, but recall that there is also the repository on GitHub for this lecture where you could also easily uh, copy the solutions from if needed. The next thing we're going to look at are uh, contract constructors, so constructor functions. And the constructor is a special function that is executed when the contract is deployed. It is executed only once, and that is uh, during deployment. And this is important, for example, when you have, a, let's say, there is already an existing smart contract, uh, a factory contract that allows you to call, uh, to invoke a specific function. Uh, let's say a genesis function. And this genesis function essentially deploys new child contracts. Um, true. So you from your EOA, um, you're, you're calling, you're invoking uh, the genesis function in the initial contract that has already been deployed. And then in an internal transaction, uh, this already deployed contract um, creates a, a new smart contract, a child contract, um, and of course, here in this example, the constructor would be needed because these child contracts, they could differ in their parameters. So um, let's say you have a, a token factory, for example, and we will look at something like this later on, uh, that allows you to deploy new token contracts through this token factory contract. Then of course the tokens, they should differ in certain parameters, for example, the token name, or uh, how many of, of these tokens exist, or the decimal places, and so on. And this could be done through the constructor. Everything else would be the same, right? But you could set the uh, initial parameters in the constructor as an example, okay? And uh, I mean, it's pretty similar to the uh, functions, uh, and you just have the keyword constructor, and then you have the parameters, and then you have the constructor body right here. Now, we will use that actually in the, uh, Second exercise. First, you remove the uh, uh, function you have created earlier. Uh, I've called it here initialize um, from the contract. And what you're doing in the second step is you add the same functionality to the constructor uh, so that at the time of deployment, you can set the beneficiary uh, to a specific address. And again, we will look at this in Remix.
All right, and what we're doing is first we are deleting this function right here. And then we are creating a constructor. Also with the parameter address underscore beneficiary. And we basically add the same functionality we had in the function before. So we set the state variable beneficiary equal to the parameter underscore beneficiary so that it is executed as part of deployment through the constructor. One more thing we have to do is setting the beneficiary state variable as immutable so that it cannot be changed except for uh, during deployment of the constructor. We compile the contract once again. We go to the deployment tab. Again, we remove the old contract from the interface. And here you can see with deployment already, you have the option to uh, add a parameter, so the beneficiary parameter. So we're going to copy the address again by clicking on account one right here. We paste it. We click on deploy to invoke the function, confirm it in MetaMask, and then we check it on Etherscan, so on the Block Explorer. We quickly wait until the transaction gets confirmed. That's the case right now, we have a success. And also, of course, you can see down here, that's the data. Of course, it's not that easy to read right now because it's the bytecode. And as expected, the beneficiary, when you click on it right here, has been set as part of deployment to the specified address, whereas everything else is on the default value. Once again, for your reference, you also have the solutions here on the slides. So um, this is the constructor, constructor, address beneficiary, and then you set the beneficiary state variable to the parameter beneficiary that is part of the function right here. And then also on a line three of the previous contract, if address public immutable beneficiary. So you set the beneficiary as immutable. And that is the entire contract as the current state of the auction contract, again, for your reference. With that, stay curious, see you soon.